Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. It's gorgeous outside. Yeah. Too bad we can't move everything outside and just have church out there. Yeah. Yeah. A little chilly. Well, okay, maybe <laughs> just a little. We got jackets. Yeah. Right. <laughs> if you're watching online, please let us know by saying hi in the comments. We'd like to know that you're here. Um, just a few announcements coming up. Yesterday we had Orange Track Racing, our final races and the finals of season 18. It's hard to believe we finished up 18 years of that and we'll be starting up 19 years in three months. It's a nice little hiatus, but it seems to fly by very quickly for us. Um, this coming Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, we'll continue our watch of The Chosen. We'll be watching episode seven. So we have two episodes left of season three, and then we are done with what's available. I know. <laughs> Until March. Until March, right. They're doing something really unique in that last, this current season they opened up like this year in February, they showed the first two episodes in theaters. They're gonna do the entire season over the course of the four weeks of February in theaters through Fathom events. So um, that'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But we will definitely, as soon as it's available on DVD, we'll be watching it here. Um, this week's episode is called Ears to Hear. And this episode will center around the chaos that the apostles caused by sharing the, Jesus's teaching in the Decapolis, a deeply divided multi-ethnic region. Hmm, sounds familiar. The episode also gives us insight into Gaius's troubled family situation and reveals a formative moment from Matthew's past. So this, uh, this is, it's got my attention. I, it's like, I really, you know, I can't wait to watch it with y'all. But meanwhile, John is assigned to bring an angry Simon to Jesus. And if you remember from this past week's episode, it is in that episode that Simon finds out that Eden had, had a miscarriage. So, very powerfully uh, emotional episode this past week. Tissues were brought out. So, and then we've got some things coming up. Um, so, December 1st, it sounds like it's a long ways away because the sun's out. It's really, it's nice out. It's not. It's like two weeks out. Give or take. But we're starting a new tradition. We talked about this last week. And, I got this idea the other day while I was just piddling about not doing anything and so made some bookmarks for y'all. So those of you that want to be analog about it and would like to put that in your Bibles there back in the uh, display back there on the table but it literally has each of the chapters with each of the days and a little check box next to it so you can go down it and check it off. There are because I like to have a little bit of fun. There's blue ones and purple ones. <laughs> Colors of royalty is the way we went with that. So uh, join in with us as we do this. This is a, reading a chapter a day of the book of Luke. And there's 24 chapters in the book, which means on Christmas Eve, when you finish that 24th chapter, you will have read the entire count of Jesus's life. And you will wake up Christmas morning knowing who and why we celebrate and then uh, for those that, of you that are watching online uh, that link will be in the notes there so you can click on that and see that and then you can follow along that way too because it's on our website as well then following that on the 2nd of december we'll have our next men's breakfast had to uh, dress this one up with a little greenery and festivity and make it look Christmassy. So uh, join us for that at nine o'clock on the second. Uh, we've had some different things over the, the months and we look forward to uh, what our little buffet will have this time around. And then starting on the third, so it's like a bam, bang, 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 first, second, third, we're just, and then we'll take a little bit of a break. But on the third, we're gonna start the sermon series, Why the Nativity? And so, more handouts. These are back there as well. If you'd like to invite someone to join us, it just talks, it says, join us for a four week series, Why the Nativity, beginning December 3rd. In Why the Nativity, we will explore in detail the people and events that surround the Christmas story and why each of them was chosen for their specific purpose. 
and there's more information on our website at gracestreet.church as well under why the nativity then we'll take a few days off and come back on the 9th of december and we're going to go out caroling and share a meal together mark and i'll be meeting tomorrow night to put the final particulars together as to times and things like that so uh, be watching social media watching your emails as we will be putting that out then you know we'll get to christmas and we'll have a beautiful christmas service and then in january our next movie bridge to terabithia starts off our uh, cinema season at Grace Street Cinema for the year and this is a, uh, a wonderful uh, event uh, it's about a preteen's life getting turned upside down when he befriends the new girl in school now that can always cause a little bit of upheaval you know meet somebody new especially a girl for a guy but in that they imagine a whole new fantasy world to escape their reality of bullying and other things that are going on in their lives so you can check out more about that at Grace Street Church by clicking on the Grace Street Cinema link or just watching our social media for that as well. And then finally, uh, our worship music will be in the comments there for those of you that are watching online so that you can join us in uh, worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, this morning. Before we go into our call to worship, let's... Just calm ourselves with a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for the new day that you've given us. Each day is a blessing. Each day is a new beginning for us, Father. Father, as we begin each new day, let us start the day by just looking to you, Father. Let us start the day with you in prayer. Father, we just thank you that we can come together in this place, that you've given us these freedoms. As yesterday, we celebrated Veterans Day, where we celebrated all the men and women who have served our great country throughout the years, who are currently serving, who have served, and who have gone on to be with you, Father. We thank you for the freedoms that we are given. We thank you that uh, by their sacrifices, that we had the freedoms of religion, freedom of speech. Father, and as we prepare to hear your word this morning, we just thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <coughs> I think I swallowed some of that ceiling dust. <coughs> we ran a new HDMI cable this morning. <laughs> so all that. <coughs> all right. Our call to worship this morning comes from Galatians chapter 6, verses 6 and 10. It says this, Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. In this passage, Paul is, number one, he's starting off by telling us that we should be taking care of those who are helping us to grow in the word, helping us to grow in our spiritual lives, and that we should not take that for granted. But then it gets to the meat of it in, in verse 7. In the analogy in my Bible, it says, it would be a surprise to plant corn and have pumpkins pop up. What we sow, we also will reap. So in the first part of that, the verse that talks about sowing to flesh, we will reap corruption. You harvest what you plant. But if we sow to the Spirit, the will of the Spirit, we will reap everlasting life. If you plant ill will, that is what you will harvest. If you plant the seeds of God, if you plant the Word of God, that is what you will harvest. And it can be very discouraging to plant 
and then have that season between planting and harvesting being a very long time. We're looking at planting this ministry in the end of 2016, planting the church in the beginning of 2018, and we are in a season of growth. We have not reached harvest yet. We're still growing. Paul encourages, and, and I know I take solace in this, and I know Mark also can. Paul encourages us to keep on doing what is good and to trust God. I'm looking forward to hearing the word this morning. This, As I think about the, the uh, title of Mark's sermon, Character Development, the first thing that popped into my mind is, our character is based on the environment in which we live. And, the, and it starts as a child and continues on as an adult. And the people that we surround ourselves with. Proverbs tells iron sharpens iron. We need to surround ourselves with other believers so that we can grow in our faith. Father God, as we prepare to hear the word that you have given to Mark this morning, we just thank you. We thank you that this series was given. We thank you for the faithfulness of Dallas and the rest of the uh, production team and the actors and actresses that have come to make this series called The Chosen. We thank you that we can learn from it, that it can spark questions and answers can be given, and we can grow through that and build our character, Father. Father, calm our hearts, settle our minds, open our ears, as we prepare to hear this message so that we can take it out with us when we leave this place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, good morning, church. How's everybody today? Good morning. Wow. How's everybody today? Great. Look at the sun outside. It's a beautiful day. It's warming up. When I came in here this morning, it was it was a whopping 36 degrees when I hopped in my car to come. And I just looked on the screen there, it's 49 already. So see, we're making progress. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So today I want to talk about character development. So in season three, episode six, as we're progressing through The Chosen, in this episode we see the absence of Jesus and that has the disciples then gearing up to defend the Messiah. Now, they're still trying to ascertain his whereabouts because they don't know where he went. He just kind of up and said, hey, I'll be back. <laughs> kind of a Schwarzenegger thing. I'll be back. <laughs> anyway, so, but even now, just with him being gone just a few days, we see that the disciples now have kind of returned to the way of the world, allowing their past to dictate their actions. So it opens up on the scene, they're all sharpening knives and axes and all kinds of things, ready to go to battle and defend the Messiah. And here we see Simon the Zealot as their model. Now he was a zealot, and for those of you who have not seen any of this in The Chosen yet, the zealots were a group that had their underground, so they're kind of behind the scenes. But they are there to try and uproot the Roman occupation of the Jews in the day. And so they were assassins of the day. If you want to think about ninjas, they're Jewish ninjas. There we go. So Simon the Zealot is actually one of the disciples, apostles now. And as they discuss that intensifying polarization, those who really understand Jesus and his words and deeds of those who reject him, of his message and his mission. So there's a whole polarization of people in that community in there that they're dealing with. And they're afraid that there's gonna be some kind of uprising amongst those people. So as the former zealot, whom most refer to simply as Z, he has to come to terms with his past. Because one of the things when you become a Jewish ninja of the day, a zealot, is you have to take an oath that you will maintain the order and uphold the order no matter what until death. So if you leave the order, they send the rest of the assassins to come get you. So he's having to deal with those kind of things as well. And they did come and track him down. So then we see Mary Magdalene and 
kind of crossing philosophical swords with Tamar and where she came from. Now, for those of you who haven't seen it, we got some catching up to do. But the two women eventually come to a better understanding of each one of their positions and of their pasts. And so they can kind of see each other in a different light. They have a different perspective. And I want you to hold on to some of these things as we go through the message today. because so we're talking about character development. And then we see that, you know, the two women are helping Zebedee, the, the father of two of the disciples in there, and uh, John and James, and there he is starting up a new olive oil business that's going to help to finance the ministry as they're going forward. And then we get introduced to Pontius Pilate and his wife. And uh, then we see that Pontius Pilate's, it's, it's kind of cool because there's intrigue in here and all kinds of fun stuff. So we got this guy that's like a CIA agent for the Romans and he's going around from Rome and he's checking up on all the territories and all these fun things. So he, he goes, and his name is Atticus, and he goes to meet with Pontius Pilate. And they're trying to figure out how they're gonna take care of all of what's going on and kind of keep an eye out on what's going on with this Jesus guy, you know, that's causing such a commotion in the region. So next, the two men come to, they're apostles of John, they come to speak to Jesus, but Jesus isn't there. And they claim that they have an important message from John the Baptist. Now he's a prisoner of King Herod at the time because he called King Herod out for marrying, divorcing his wife and marrying his brother's wife. And so, see how the two men claim to know Simon Peter's brother, Andrew. Peter asks them questions about Andrew so they can sure, he can be sure that they're legit. Now, this all sounds like a huge soap opera, doesn't it? Yeah. But see, what this is, is this is all character development for the series. So in this episode, we didn't have a lot of scriptural things to deal with in here, but we had a lot of backstory, a lot of character development, and kind of a foretelling of what was yet to come in these series. And so that is all what's called character development. And so it kind of lays the foundation for what is going on with the characters in the series. But I want to talk to you today about a different type of character development here. So a different kind of type of character when we think about this we're we're developing the characters of these people in here so we better understand their role in the series but see as we do this in life we have character development of our own that we go through and so that's what i want to talk about today and a couple of years ago i had a message about character and what do we see ourselves to be versus what others see us to be and so I ask a series of questions there. The first one is, who are you? Who are you? Who do you know yourself to be? Who does the world think you are? Notice I said think you are. And who does God know you to be? So as we go through this today, and as I'm talking about these things in here, I kind of want you to think about those things. Because each one of us have that picture of who we are. But do you really know yourself? Do you really know? Do other people really know who you are? And how does God see you to be? See, he sees your actions no matter what. So according to scripture, Christian character includes the pursuit of truth and godliness, righteousness, <clears throat> love and joy and peace and gentleness and kindness and patience and perseverance meekness, which means self-control, humility, a different type of self-control, compassion, thankfulness, forgiveness, contentment, and unity. That's all fruits of the Spirit as you come in and develop your spiritual relationship with God and with Jesus. So when we think about all these things, uh, we think of these as spiritual gifts, is what the, the scriptures tell us they are. And as we develop our character with God, then God gives us these gifts and imparts these gifts to us to help build our character in Christ and in Him. So in that message that I gave, we learned that character is in large part a product of one's childhood environment and a relationship with their caregiver. How your parents treated you, 
how your teachers treated you. Because truly, as you're going through school, your teachers are actually caregivers as well. And you have to understand that. So a large part of our character then is produced by the environment that we grow up in. That develops our character. So we have to think about that. And as parents, you really, really, really need to think about that. Because how you treat your children, if it's adverse or hurtful circumstances growing up, they lead to a negative character. And those traits such as lying and cheating and stealing, we see that very rampant in the news today. So if you're treated poorly in your child developmental stages for your character, that sometimes carries on later on in life. So if we have neglect, condescension, and spiteful language, well, that can cause and provoke in that character development very low self-esteem. They don't have a very good opinion of themselves. They only know themselves to be less than what they actually can be or actually are. And so as parents, as we're raising children up, we have to be cognizant of how we treat the children, how we talk to them. If we talk down to them all the time, guess what? They're gonna have a very low self-esteem. Children come to believe that in their personal qualities and in that way they are being undesirable and they're worthy of reproach. Thus they repress these traits of developing feelings of fear, remorse, insecurity, and these feelings can continue on into adulthood. Left unchanged and unchecked, it can be very unhappy and very destructive for their lives and it may lead to acting out against others, the inability to verbalize their emotions properly to others and become socially disconnected or what is termed sociopathic, which is kind of on the extreme, but we don't want to get there. This is all part of character development. And sometimes those kind of negative traits then turn to violence. And we see a lot of violent people in the world today. So when we have these traits present, it can lead to many forms of addiction and attempt to numb down their feelings of inadequacy. These things are very, very important because childhood development carries on and builds that foundation of their character just like what I was talking about earlier when I talked about the foundation of the characters in this series. That is the foundation of the character that your children grow up in. When we have these traits present, it can lead to all kinds of things that are undesirable for their future. So if you've ever been there at some time in your life, you know exactly where I'm coming from. I know, I was there. It's not a place you want to be in and not a place you want to stay in. So you have to make a change. There has to be a change. So when we contrast them, this was someone who's had that ability to develop that good sense of character. Their lives can be very, very different. Good character includes traits like loyalty, honesty, courage, integrity, fortitude, and other important virtues that promote good behavior. So positive reinforcement gives you positive outcomes in the development of the characters of that child or actually anyone in life. So a person with good character chooses to do the right thing because he or she believes it's morally right to do so. It's a whole different change of mind. See, people that grow up in that negative, well, that negative is what they know, and then they act out upon the negative. But if they grow into a positive environment, then they choose to do the right thing because they think it's morally the right thing to do. They don't act out against it. Other positive character traits that they believe in, he or she believes in, is morally right to do so, but morals then define that person's character. For example, being persistent or creative can extend excellent attributes, but are not really moral imperatives, if you know what I mean. It's not a decision of right or wrong, but it's a reflection of doing the right thing as a choice. 
What a person possesses a good character is exhibited in his or her words and actions. And it's not limited to his single value, but the traits are demonstrated in the good choices they make and the bad choices they avoid. So if we positive reinforce that person from an early standpoint in their life, then the typical outcome of that is they're gonna make better choices in their life. They're gonna make good choices and very few bad choices. So when we think about how others see us, it's largely based on our character traits, good or bad. And see, that's when I ask you those questions. Who are you? Who do you see yourself to be? Who does the world, those around you, think you are? And who does God need you to be? So when you think about that, it comes down to who you are right or wrong is they form an opinion of your worth in society based on who they see you to be. And that's right or wrong in the decision process. It's important to understand that there is a difference between character, which is your inward traits of who you've developed to be, and a reputation. Because a reputation is what others think about us, what other people think about us. Character is what God and the whole heaven knows us to be. And so I like to, uh, to, to think about that in a couple of different ways. Reputation is the external thing that people see. And character is your internal person that you are. Okay? In the end, when all things are said and done, what matters most is who we really are in the sight of God. Who does God see us to be? A common example of what character consists of is this. Character is who you are when nobody else is looking. <clears throat> who you are when nobody else is looking. See, a lot of people put on a facade, and they, they tend to people might know you by the facade that you put on, but that's not truly who you are. But see, God knows past that. He doesn't look at facades. He looks at what's in your heart. So that character consists of who you are when no one else is around, when no one else is looking. Now this can be either good or bad depending upon who you are. Who you are, it depends on your character. And so as we develop our character in here, that's a very, very, very important part, who you know yourself to be. Now here's a sticking point that I've always had issue and that is, your past is your past, and you can't travel back in time and change it, even if you have a DeLorean, you can't do it, okay? No more back in time here. But your past is your past, and if you're living your future according to your past, guess what? You'll never get to the future that was meant for you to have. Now, I've said that so many times, and hopefully it sinks in, but what this means is you need to overcome your past and move on. You need to build a new character if your past is not where you want to be and you didn't have a good past, well, guess what? You're not stuck there for life. It's time to make a change. And you change your character to develop what you want to be, okay? In other words, you need to die to your old self, as it says in the Bible, and start anew. Your identity is not tied to what others think of you. Your identity is what you choose to be in your heart. That's very important, so I want you to hang on to that. Your identity is not tied to what others think of you. Your identity is what you choose to give your heart to. So the things that you truly give your heart to, what you really have a passion about, that becomes your identity. So you... If you've got all these negative things going on in your life, make sure you haven't given your heart to those. It's time to make a change, time to change direction, and then have a better outcome in the end. So in our call to worship today, I chose the Galatians 6, 6 through 10, and it says in there, let him who taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived, because God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will shall also reap. So if we sow negativity in our lives, and we 
focus on negativity in our lives and our heart is given to negativity, guess what we're going to reap? Negative results, right? Negativity. And this is what this whole thing is saying. For he who sows to his flesh, he who plants in his own flesh, will then reap the corrupted flesh. So if you sow good things, you'll reap good things. If you sow bad things, you'll reap bad things. But he who sows to the Spirit will reap, uh, of the will of the Spirit will reap everlasting life. And what this means is, if you are reaping, if you're sowing to the Spirit of God, if you're following God's will for your life, then you will reap everlasting life. God will bless you with everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, we have an opportunity. Let us do good to all, especially to those who are in the household of faith. And that doesn't mean that you're only supposed to do good to people who go to church. That's not what that means. <laughs> what that means is, you know, as you look at the family of God as a whole out here, those who you do good to will return that good to you as well. And this speaks to us of the character of Jesus as the teacher of all good things. When we think about that in here, he is righteous in all he does and says. Which brings us back to episode 6. Now in episode 6 we see that John the Baptist, who's sitting in prison because he called Herod out for his bad behavior. So he's sitting in prison and he he is frustrated for the lack of action to either get him out of prison or for Jesus to start this revolution. Now, the Jews back in the days kind of had a misconception of what the prophecies were saying. The prophecies of old said that the Messiah is going to come and he's going to overturn everything in the world because he has overcome the world. But truly what that meant was he is coming to rid the people of sin in their lives, to call them to repentance to call them back into building a positive character for their lives. So anyway, John the Baptist is sitting in prison, and he's kind of a radical. So he sends two of his followers to Jesus. But, as I said earlier, Jesus wasn't in town at the time. So then Jesus finally returns to Capernaum, and then everybody kind of zeroes in on it. So they, you know, to give you some more of the backstory is they had built this huge tent city after he gave the Sermon on the Mount of, uh, yeah, Sermon on the Mount. And so they had hundreds and hundreds of people flocking into Capernaum and they set up a tent city outside there so they had somewhere to stay until they could see Jesus and, and possibly get healed by him spiritually or physically. So anyway, we're back in there. You have all these people from Tent City. Jesus comes back into Capernaum, and he's just immediately surrounded by a crowd. And John sends his, his two of his disciples to question Jesus. And so they finally kind of spread him out, give him some open space, and these two disciples of John the Baptist come up to Jesus. And I'll go through Matthew 11, 2 through 19, where it tells the story. So John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about all the things the Messiah was doing. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, Are you the Messiah that we've been expecting, or should we look for somebody else? Now understand that John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin, so he's known him since child. They're exactly the same age, within weeks. So then Jesus told him, Go back to John and tell him what you have seen and heard. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cured, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised to life. And the good news is being preached to the poor. And tell him, God blesses those who don't turn away because of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began talking about him to the crowds. Now, what kind of man do, do you go to see in the wilderness? Was he a weak reed, swayed by the wind? Or were you expecting to see a man dressed in expensive clothes? No. People with expensive clothes live in palaces. Were you looking for a prophet? Yes. 
And he tells him, he says, he is more than a prophet. John is the man whom the scriptures refer to when they say, look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way before you. I tell you the truth of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. Yet even the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. And from the time John the Baptist began preaching until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and violent people are attacking it. For before John came, all the prophets and the laws of Moses looked forward to this present time. And if you're willing to accept what I say, he is Elijah, the one the prophets said would come. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. To what can I compare this generation? It's like children playing a game in the public square. They complained to their friends, we played wedding songs and you didn't dance. So then we played funeral songs and you didn't mourn. For John didn't spend his time eating and drinking. And you say, he's possessed by a demon. The son of man, on the other hand, feasts and drink and you say he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. But wisdom is shown to be right by its results. Now that's a lot of words, okay? But it has very, very deep meaning. So in a way, John the baptizer was calling out Jesus because he wanted things to progress much faster than what they were at the time. To the casual observer, it may look as though John is calling Jesus' character into question. After all, that's a pretty strong statement to make in public. Are you the Messiah that we've been expecting? Or should we keep looking for somebody else? That's kind of a slap in the face, right? Yeah. Are you the Messiah we've been expecting? Or should we expect somebody else? And so you see Jesus doing some, for lack of better terms, damage control. But at the same time, protecting John's reputation with the crowd. Reputation meaning who the crowd sees him to be. And the Pharisees were there taking it all in. So I have a question for you tonight. What do you do when someone re impugns your reputation? Kind of tears you down, says something bad about you. What do you do? First reaction. Anybody know? Lash out at them? quickly to try to discredit them. Darn right. That's human nature, right? That's human nature at its finest. And we see that day to day. Turn on a news channel. Somebody is impugning someone else's reputation and the other side is fighting back against it. And it's a constant war that just simply escalates. So that's human nature. But what did Jesus do? So John's disciples came up and they were kind of slapping him in the face in front of the whole public, the whole gathering that was there. So what did Jesus do? Well, he speaks of his divine character to his distractor at the time. He lists them up to those around him, just the opposite of human nature. And listen to what he said. He said, I tell you the truth, of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. Yet even the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. And he closes by saying this, but wisdom is shown to be right by results. In other words, the truth will set you free. So where does that leave us in our world today? See, we're, we're too willing to strike back against them, but Jesus shows us by his teaching. Remember our call to worship this morning. Jesus shows us by his teaching that, hey, it's better to lift that person up. It's better to lift that person up. What happens when we do that? We take away their ammunition. There's nothing to fire back against, is there? Hmm. Won the battle before it started. Neat concept, huh? So if we go in negativity and we bring it back with positive against it, the battle's done. Battle's over. So we have a choice to make. If we have a bad reputation, 
Well, we know that it's time to make a change. Do others see your character as flawed? Well, if so, it's time to make a change. When Jesus was speaking with Nicodemus about being born again, he was telling him that no one who follows the ways of the world will enter into the kingdom of heaven. A change needed to be made. And that means confession, repentance, change from your old ways, and follow it. Very simple. You confess that you're a sinner, and you say, hey, I'm sorry for what I've done. God knows we're going to screw up and make mistakes. That's why he sent Jesus. That's why he sent Jesus. Because we are human. And in our humanness, we're fallible. We make mistakes. So we have to change our old ways and we have to follow him in order to get that heavenly reward, as it said in the call to worship this morning. If we follow by the will of the Spirit instead of by our human nature, then God will give us then that spirit to give us everlasting life. And that's called salvation. But even Nicodemus, now Nicodemus was what? He was one of the head Pharisees, right? He was a teacher of the law of Moses. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. But Nicodemus was so caught up in the literalness of the statement of having to be born again, his first question to Jesus was, well, I've got a real problem with this because if I have to be born again, if I've got to go back into my mother's womb, my mother's dead, so I can't do it. So he missed the point completely. But what he was, so he was utterly confused and couldn't grasp that change needed to be made in a person's life in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. He was just way too literal about it. And sometimes I think that's what we do to the Bible when we're reading the Bible is, we take it so literally in there that we miss the entire point of what's being said in the scripture. See, we must die to ourselves in order to be born again, reborn from who we are to who we could become. So you won't find that in the scriptures. That's a Markism. We must die to ourselves in order to be born again, reborn from who we are, to who we could become. See, God's got a plan for our lives from since the time before we were born. Scriptures tell us about it. He knew numbered the hairs on our head back then. You know, I wish you would uh, give me a little bit more. But I had some earlier on in life, but it all went away. So let go of the past and don't look back. Right, Steve? Yeah. Come so that means all of our past is washed clean, done. Release it so you can live for the future. That's what it means to be born again. We release ourselves from our past. Release ourselves from, the, from all the stuff that we did in our past so that we can accept that <laughs> gift of salvation, that gift of being washed clean from our sins. It's all said and done. Release it so you can live for the future. If we keep holding on to the past, it'll keep us from getting to the future that God planned for us. And I like into this, I, I love this because this illustration popped in my head. It's like tr trying, tying, having one arm tied behind your back and trying to climb a rope. Not gonna happen in your lifetime, right? One arm tied behind your back and then try and climb a rope. Not gonna happen. So, how, you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked. We need to live with a different perspective on our life. And a perspective is how we view things. It's how we have a Christian worldview or how we have a worldview of the world around us, our life, our jobs, those who are friends, those who are acquaintances, those who are enemies. That all defines what our perspective is. So we need to have a different perspective of the world around us. We need to have a new Christian perspective. See, the world perspective is not going to help you get to heaven. The world turns its back on Christian worldview because it binds them to a set of beliefs and morals that hamper their lifestyles. Oh, I don't want to do any of that Bible stuff over there. I have to give up all the fun stuff I love to do. And so they turn their back on the Christian lifestyle. 
And all I got to say is, I hope they like heat. And lots of it. Forever. So I want to close with something that I've taught for years. And this is on your perspective. Your perspective drives your thoughts. Your thoughts determine your actions. Your actions define your character, and your character is the outward and visible sign for all to see. Your character is your moral compass that will determine your future. If you don't like the person you see when you look in the mirror, then it's time to make a change in your life. Change your perspective and you change your life. That's as hard as it gets. It's also as easy as it gets. So we have to look at the world through a different set of lenses. We have to look at each other with a different set of lenses instead of seeing you know, hate and negativity. We have to look through what? We have to lift them up. We have to edify them. If there's negativity in that person's life, it probably means that they're going through some stuff. And if we look at our own lives, we're going through some stuff. And sometimes it comes out negatively against others. But if we change our perspective and we look at that and we say, hey, these people are going through stuff. Maybe I can help them out of that stuff. Maybe I can help them with that situation. Maybe I can lift them up so they don't have to deal with that all the time. And you deal with it positively instead of negatively. And guess what? That just changed your worldview. That just changed your perspective. And it'll change your life. See, the only one responsible for your future is you. Others can influence your decisions, but you still make them. Kids, I want you to hang on to that because that will help you in life. No one is responsible for your future but you. Others can influence your decisions, but you still make the decisions in your life. No one is responsible for your character development but you. So today, choose wisely. Let us pray. Gracious Lord God, we come to you today and we confess that we are sinners. We are in need of your grace and mercy today. We repent of our sins and we pray for forgiveness. We pray that by the power and the love and the blood of Jesus that we can be redeemed and made whole again with you. Lord, we ask that you come into our hearts and we make you our Lord and Savior. We thank you for your blessed assurance that we will be with you in heaven and that your spirit gives us the strength, the hope, and the love to be your disciples in this lost world. Lord, we lift up our lives, our church, our city, our state, and our nation to you. And we ask that you would do a mighty act of healing in us and in the world today because we live in such a broken world. Help us to be that positive change in the world. We ask that your name and your word would be boldly proclaimed and that your works would be done. Embolden us today to step up and step out, to bring home the lost, to lead us to growth in your spirit, and to keep us unto you today, Lord. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. If you're worshiping with us for the first time this morning, the communion cups, there's two sides. You want to open up the bottom or the smaller side to get the bread and then the top for the juice. I was reading this passage from 1 Corinthians 11 this morning, and this is from the Passion Translation. It's a slightly different translation. It's a newer translation, but it says this, I have handed down to you what, I came, what came to me by direct revelation from the Lord himself. This is Paul talking. Direct revelation from the Lord himself. The same night in which he was handed over, he took bread and he gave thanks. Then he distributed it to the disciples and said, 
take it and eat your fill. It is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Paul continues by saying he did the same with the cup of wine after supper and said, this cup seals the new covenant with my blood. Drink it. And whenever you drink this, do it to remember me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are retelling the story, proclaiming our Lord's death until he comes. Mark talked about how the people around us, the things around us, create and develop our character. When we go to God and when we allow God to do that, that is the, the, my big summary of, of Mark's message this morning. When we allow God to shape that character, then we can sh be a reflection of him. And as we eat this bread and drink this cup each time, we are reminded of that. It's a remembrance for us that our character is developed by our relationship with our Lord and Savior. The body of Christ broken for you, take it. And the blood of Christ shed for you, take and drink. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what this meal represents. We, have, we thank you for, as we do this each week, we don't do it just simply out of tradition, Father. We do it because it is because of your revealed word to us. It is because your son came and lived a perfect life and took on the sins of the entire world. Whether people believe in him or you or not, he came for each one of us. We thank you for that, Father. In Jesus' name. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you all here today. <laughs> um, I do prayers for the people, so if you have a prayer request or anything, just let me know and I'll pray for you. So, anyway, I think I have quite a few here, so we'll get going here. Okay. Oh, well, Father God, please let your Holy Spirit rest upon all who are here and online this morning as we pray for one another. We come to you with honor and praise to glorify your holy name. As Psalms 121, one and two says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. You watch over our lives from the beginning to end. In every trial, you are there to guide us through it. All we need to do is ask in prayer and faith believing for you will never leave us or forsake us. So help us to be faithful to you and vigilant in prayer, blessing you with our lives. Father God, I lift up Chloe and Becky to you this morning. Chloe is in the hospital, Lord. She needs your help. You are the great physician and healer of all our needs. She is precious in your sight. We lay her at your feet to heal her from this virus that is attacking her body. Please strengthen her and heal her from this. In the mighty name of Jesus, give them both peace in their minds and comfort them and their hearts today as they rest knowing you are in control and you are a mighty God who saves. Father God, we pray for continued healing for all those who are in our church family that have had surgeries in the past few months. You are a great God full of mercies new each day and we glorify you, your holy name, and thank you for the healings. We ask a special healing for Amanda and Kelly, that you walk with them through their trials they are facing. Give them courage for each new day. Let them not fear, for you are holding on to them. And thank you, Jesus, for their healing, my God. I pray for the homeless, that you will protect them from the elements, and they will always have plenty of food and nourish, to nourish their bodies. Help them find work to help them up and off the streets, in Jesus' name. We praise you for all things. We praise you for the new roof for Carla and Bill that we prayed for for three years. It came as a new house, 
So we thank you, Jesus, for that. What a beautiful blessing. We praise you, for you are such a great God, and you are always in the details of our lives. We thank you, Jesus, for the brave men and women who have served our country to give us freedom that we have today. We thank you, God, for the blessing always. Comfort them in their trials and walk with them daily. Father God, we ask for Denny's, Denny to get a new furnace, get it replaced quickly, Lord Jesus, in Jesus' holy name. And Father God, as it always, I lift up to you our children and grandchildren, that you will lead them into a right relationship with you, that you will guide them through each trial and meet them right where they are and bring them back to you. For in Proverbs 8, 35, 36, it says, For whoever finds me finds life and receives favor from the Lord. But whoever fails to find me harms himself. All who hate me love death. So let us all write God's word on our hearts and minds. Let us talk about God to our families and friends. Let us spread the good news about our, our amazing God and how he saves lives and forgives us of our sins. He gives us grace and mercies new each and every day. And there is amazing grace for all who find him. And in Isaiah 41.10, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Thank you, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Just like that, the online portion of our service is over today. So we thank you all for joining us online today. I saw quite a number of people online and, and we welcome you. And if you uh, would like to come and join us in person, you're more than welcome at any time. Uh, it's always nice to be in the fellowship of the church itself, the body of Christ. So let us close out this time right now with a word of prayer and then uh, Make sure you listen to the music today because there's some special messages in the music that I've chosen today. So dear Lord, help us to do our very best each day to affirm one another and to remove the barriers that sin seem to hinder our relationships and keep us at a distance from one another. Please give us your grace to heal our short tempers, our destructive habits, and, and to help let go of the grudges that we hold on to so tightly. Inspire us dear God, to be re-gifters instead of your grace, your mercy, your blessings, and your love. Help us to be ambassadors of your forgiveness and of your healing love, and especially of your wisdom, Lord. Loving and gracious God, pour out your spirit upon us so that we will have the courage to reach out to those who have offended or hurt us, so that we might edify them, that we might lift them up, and take them out of their burdens. With your inspiration, Heavenly Father, may our efforts to heal the wounds that hurt our families, hurt our church, and hurt our world, Lord, lead our hearts to worship you more and fully each day. Bless us, dear God, that we might have hearts full of your grace, that instead of turning in retribution against another for something they may have said or done, Help us, Lord, to live in your peace and to help them get out of the negative situations that they're in. May we strive to be reconciled to you and to one another in all things. Help us to always remember and live by the words that Jesus shared with his disciples when he taught them to pray. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Amen.